Dr. Toby Walsh, Laureate Fellow and Professor of AI at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Toby, what are the main security risks associated with DeepSeek that have led to these government bans? But there's concerns around privacy and concerns around malware. Privacy in the sense that if you type something into the chatbot, you're sharing it with DeepSeek in China. Uh, and you shouldn't be typing anything sensitive into anyone's chatbot, not ChatGPT. You're sharing it with a, a company in the US. Um, similarly, you shouldn't be typing anything sensitive into a chatbot in China because, well, who knows who's going to end up with the data. And then issues around malware. Um, you can actually download, I mean, one of the novelties of DeepSeek is that it's open source. You can actually download it and run it on your a computer, but that might be potentially introducing some malware. So realistically, how significant is the threat of AI tools like DeepSeek being exploited for cyber attacks or misinformation? Uh, I think the threat is very real. Um, they, they are going to already being used in, in many respects to, to personalize malware and cyber attacks. So it's something that we should be very concerned about. Um, uh, I think this perhaps, though, heralds the start of a fracturing of the AI world. We saw this with the internet. We have two internets. We have the Western internet, and then behind the great firewall of China, we have the Chinese internet. And there's there's you know very little uh, competition between the two. I fear that we may end up in the same place with a Chinese version of AI and a Western version of AI. So would you say that these regulatory moves ju are justified? And like you said, do they risk stifling AI innovation here? Well, I don't think this is going to stifle innovation in the sense the cat is out of the bag. The, we know that you can do this. We know that you can build language models, foundation models like DeepSeek much cheaper, much more efficiently. They only spent apparently $6 million to do this. Um, and it's a bit like running the four-minute mile. When Roger Spanister ran the first four-minute mile and we knew it was possible, humanly possible, lots of people were then able to do it. Well, lots of people are now able to do this. There's already a number of races elsewhere to rebuild deep seek uh, in the western open source world as a there's a, comp a competition on uh, hugging face the open source platform where we share such models to do that um, and that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks we're going to have uh, western alternatives so um, it is really you know made the ai race anyone's to win but seeing restrictions in australia and now in south korea do you expect more countries to follow suit Yes, unfortunately, I do expect more countries to follow suit. I expect uh, perhaps, you know, this fracturing of the world into two, two parts of the world, just like we've seen the fracturing of the internet into two different, it's essentially two different internets. Um, you're going to see, you know, the Chinese offerings where, you know, companies that are happy with Chinese offerings are going to go with those. And we're going to see Western offerings where countries are, are not. So it, it is, you know, it is creating this division between uh, how AI is going to be developed, I fear. Now, with you anticipating more bans and restrictions, what impact do you see uh, that they have on the broader AI industry and international AI regulation? Well, I don't think you should see this solely in terms of a Chinese-US competition. I mean, it, this it, this, ha this happens to be in this case. It is you know, many of people's concerns are because it's a Chinese company, not some other company. But uh, it has demonstrated that the the tech the the you know the methodology the the way that the U, U.S. tech companies were going about it, um, throwing more money deep, whoever had the deepest pockets was going to win this race, um, is actually um, not sustainable, um, and the you know, it's cheaper. Uh, more live competitors are going to come in um, and do much the same. So um, the complacency I think that people had, and indeed you see it in the stock market, uh, that you know, it was going to be OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, who were going to win the air race, is um, is not the case. It's it's anyone's race still to win. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be deep seek, uh, but it demonstrates that this idea of just throwing more resources at the problem, um, having deeper pockets to your competitors, is not how you're going to win the air race. It's by actually having the best ideas. So from a government perspective, how should they strike a balance between security and the benefits of AI, uh, AI tools uh, offer? Well, the good news is for other countries that we haven't talked about, whether that be Singapore uh, or countries in Europe or anywhere else, is that you know, deep-seek success 
demonstrates that anyone can do this. You don't need the vast resources that the US tech companies have been throwing at AI. Um, it's possible to build up your own sovereign AI capability. And indeed, in the last week, we've already heard announcements both from India uh, and from Europe to build large foundational models like this themselves. Um, it opens up the possibility for countries themselves to build something that, you know, that applies to their values and for which that they can trust. That's the government perspective. But what about AI companies' perspective? How transparent should they be in terms of handling their data collection and usage? Well, in, in most countries, you're subject to the laws of those countries, and we increasingly have you know, better laws and about transparency and about data protection. Europe has given us GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that has actually improved um, people's privacy. Uh, similar rules are being applied in California and various other countries. There are, the last count I, I did, there are 17 countries outside Europe that have something like GDPR. So, um, those sorts of rules are going to give you the sorts of transparency. And, and the good news here is that countries are waking up to the idea that AI technologies are going to play into this space in a very critical, important way, and they need to bring down the force of those laws on those companies. So how do you see AI governance uh, evolving moving forward to handle security risk while fostering innovation? Well, I think the biggest factor in that is the European Union. Uh, last year, they passed the very first general purpose regulation, the EU AI Act. That came into force uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, the AI office, the, the part of the European bureaucracy charged with uh, implementing that is now getting up to speed. Um, and that is going to really set the tone, I suspect, for many other places. Uh, in Australia, where I happen to live, uh, the Australian government is discussing introducing similar sorts of regulation. Just like I mentioned, the GDPR has been rather viral. 17 countries have something very similar to GDPR that protects your privacy. I strongly suspect we're going to end up in many places something very similar to the EUA Act. It set a very important precedent uh, for many other places. Now, on a similar matter, I understand that you'll be attending the AI Action Summit in Paris next week. What can we expect from that summit? Well, this actually AI Action Summit is the third of uh, intergovernmental meetings. The first two were interestingly called AI Safety Summits. They were much more focused on risk and safety. Um, President Macron, who is hosting this, the third meeting after the meetings in Bletchley Park and, and Seoul, South Korea, um, has renamed this. Uh, action. And I think President Macron would like to be seen more of an action man. And, uh, and whilst there is going to be significant discussions uh, around how we manage the risks, uh, both immediate and long term, that AI may be introducing, um, there's also a lot more in this summit about how we're actually going to profit from these technologies, how they're going to supercharge the way we go about science, how they're going to um, increase the speed and reduce the cost of discovering new drugs. Um, the real benefits that AI is going to bring to our lives alongside the, the risks that we've you know, touched upon earlier in this interview. I right, look forward to that summit. And thank you so much, uh, Toby, for sharing with us uh, your thoughts on this matter. That we'll be speaking to Toby Walsh, the Laureate Fellow and Professor of AI at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Thank you.